Professor John Newnham, our founding investigator, um, along with Fiona Stanley, Lewis Lando, thank you for coming today, um, and Con Michael. Um, and still, I think, you are the RAIN Studies number one advocate, for which I'm eternally grateful. Now, normally I ask John to talk about the science, but now I want to talk him to, him to talk us through a bit more of a personal journey. Uh, we've had an early career perspective, so we've asked John to t take a stroll down memory lane um, and to tell us a little bit about what he wished he had known <laughs> as an early career researcher when first starting out. So over to you, John. Well, thank you, Romola, and I'd just like to say how honoured and thrilled I am to be here, and it's a true privilege for me, and when you're asked to speak about things other than your data, you know you're getting old, and, uh, well, I'm not that old, but I, um, I'm, I've been given the title, What I Wish I Had Known as an Early Career Researcher, and, and the answer is very simple. I, I wish I'd known this was going to work. I, I wish I'd been able to see today. I wish I'd been able to see the next two slides I'm about to show. I, I couldn't have imagined in my wildest dreams that this could be so successful. My, my story, and I, I think I've got a few minutes extra, so my, my story, you asked me what my story, my story is this, I was going to become a general surgeon, like all football players were going to become general surgeons. I had, had no interest in obstetrics whatsoever. I arrived at King Edward, and, but I had one thing in the back of my mind, and that was I always wanted to be an explorer. When I was a young boy, I used to read books about explorers. I read a book about Lassiter's Lost Reef that some of you more senior members may know about, a man who believed he'd found a reef of gold outside Alice Springs but could never find it again. And I, I was going to devote my life to finding Lassiter's Reef. And I announced this to my family when I was 14. My parents said, no, Lassiter was a madman. There is no Lassiter's Reef. And, that, and that's when my career as an explorer ended. I, I don't like being cold. I don't like being hungry. I don't like being inconvenienced. So none of those other explorer books really fitted the bill. And there were no continents left to explore. So, so I, I gave up on it. I did medicine. I was going to do general surgery. I arrived at King Edward, and I, I saw these babies coming out. And some were fat, and some were thin. Some were early, some were late. Some were covered in bowel motion, the meconium that we've heard about this morning. And I, and I looked at them and I thought, well, what does this mean for the rest of their lives? And I asked my tutor, what does this mean? And my tutor said, well, it, it doesn't mean anything. Life begins at birth and, and your birthdays start on day zero. Paediatrics begins on the day you're born and the job of an obstetrician is to deliver the baby alive and then get the placenta out and then you can go and have a cup of coffee. So that was my understanding. I thought, this can't be right. I didn't believe it. I thought that the nine months before birth have to mean something. And there was no, there, there was nothing in the literature. No one was studying it, no one was interested in it. And I thought I had found my undiscovered continent and I have spent the rest of my life exploring it. So I've been very privileged to be able to do this. And, but I had no idea that, um, that these slides wouldn't work. <laughs> Hard. Yeah. It works, thank you. <laughs> Too hard. OK, so I had no idea about this. So, so basically, what I wanted to do was to find out what is the relationship between events before birth and, and the events through the rest of your life. And, uh, and, and basically, the original grant ap application describes this, but with no understanding that it, it, it could contain so much success as it has. And I certainly had no idea that it would bring in 41 million in grants, uh, it would bring in, it attract more than 500 active researchers, there would be an average of 70 new projects each year, and very importantly, there would be 680 uh, publications by now as a result of the RAIN study. Who could have imagined that it could possibly be so successful? And it's been so successful because of all the people who've contributed to it, both the participants, the current leadership, and previous leaderships. It has been a, a story of great West Australian success. I would like to acknowledge this man, and I want to take you back to the, to the, to the mid to late 1980s. I, I had just come back from my overseas training no one knew who I was. I was a very junior staff obstetrician. 
I had this view that life before birth meant something. I trained in obstetrics because I was so fascinated by it, uh, but I didn't know how to get into studying it. And, and at the time, it was, it was very lonely. No one else thought this was important. And I heard about this man. His name's David Barker. And he was an epidemiologist, a cardiology epidemiologist in Southampton in England. And in 1986, as we saw this morning, uh, he, he published a paper in The Lancet saying that life before birth meant something. He'd studied a, co a, a cohort from Hertfordshire from 1910, 1920s, and looked at their birth weight in pounds and the placental weight which they had and correlated it with the chance of dying of heart disease 60, 70 years later. And he found if you were born of low birth weight, it increased your risk of heart disease. At the time, that was considered absolutely ridiculous. But it fitted entirely with what I thought may well be the case. I, I found David Barker, and he was coming to Perth to, 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 to give a, yeah, to coming to Singapore, I think, to give a conference. And I managed somehow to get some money to fly him to Perth. And I went to various people around Perth, and I said, I want to put on a symposium on the early origins of the, the pre-birth origins of adult health. And um, people say, that's ridiculous. There's no such thing. Some people had heard of him. They thought he was a, a madman, you know, uh, that, that this was crazy, that uh, clearly this is not the case. And um, so I said, well, I'm going to put on a conference, at, a one-day symposium at, at King Edward, and we're going to talk about it. And so they won't come to King Edward. This is a political gesture. They would only come if it was on neutral territory with a neutral chairperson. So I went to the dean, Stephen Schultz, he was a psychologist. Uh, he said, oh, I'd love to chair that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, it's got to be neutral. It was held in the Geography Lecture Theatre here at UWA, <laughs> which is an old wooden lecture theatre with tiered seating. I absolutely loved it. Anyway, we, had, we, we held the symposium, and it was all very, very difficult. And this was all complete heresy. But the certain people uh, believed it and helped, helped move this subject forwards. And those people are Laurie Balin. Put your hand up, please, Laurie, who was the senior physician at Royal Perth Hospital. <laughs> he realised that hypertension was going to have a pre-birth origin. Professor Lou Landau, the, dean of, the professor of paediatrics and then dean of the medical school. Lou. And I found a young epidemiologist working in the Department of Medicine at Charlie's who I thought had a future in this field. Her name was Dr Fiona Stanley. And so she, jo she joined in as well. And the professor of obstetrics, my boss, Con Michael, also joined. So without those people, uh, this wouldn't have gone anywhere because I was a junior nobody. Anyway, David Barker had the correlation between low birth weight and subsequent heart disease, and that negative correlation was called the Barker hypothesis. And the story is much more complex than that, and it's now known as the developmental origins of health and disease. And the RAIN study was the first pregnancy intensive cohort study based around that concept, and always will be, because no one can catch us, catch us up. What happened then was I managed to get an NHMRC grant, and there's somebody else to thank. This is King Edward's first NHMRC grant. It was done by interview. 10% of the money had to come to Western Australia. So I was interviewed by a couple of people who thought the idea was good, and this was to do the ultrasounds. This was a randomised controlled trial trying to prevent preterm birth, my lifelong passion, uh, uh, by doing five ultrasounds versus one ultrasound to see if we could prevent preterm birth. And, uh, and I had no one to collaborate with. It was very lonely at King Edward as a researcher in those days. I was an N of one. Uh, but the superintendent of the hospital, Dr Stan Reid, agreed to have, to have his name on the grant application. He had no track record. You didn't need it in those days. You just need to do well at the interview. T time, times have changed. And then having got the grant to, to do the ultrasounds, uh, I then heard that the Rain Foundation put out a call for one grand idea. So Mary Rain left her estate to investigate the origins of disease in humans. That money led to the Busselton study. Dr Cullen in Busselton, the doctor in Busselton, had this idea that high blood pressure and high cholesterol levels in early adulthood would lead to heart disease and hypertension. And that was the origins of the Busselton study funded by Mary Rain's money. That was the origins of heart disease in early adult life. And my idea was it starts much earlier in fetal life and we took that idea to the RAIN Foundation 
and, and I, I wrote it, but Con Michael and Lou Landau and Fiona Stanley are joined. Without them, there is no way they would have given this money to this, this nobody young obstetrician working on the staff at King Edward. So, and then, and then Laurie Bailin joined forces with us very soon thereafter. This is the original rain study team of 1989 outside Carson House at King Edward. Uh, and um, the woman bottom right on the front is Pam Stevenson. Pam Stevenson recruited most of the women to the rain study. She was a wonderful, wonderful recruiter. Everybody loved Pam. Pam would say to you, I'd like you to be in this study. No one could possibly say no. So for Gen 1 participants in this room, you may remember Pam Stevenson. She recruited you. And at the time, we said uh, it was only for 10 years because the original grant application, I wrote as lifetime. I said, recruiting you to, for a lifetime study. And Lou Landau, a wise professor of paediatrics, said to me, John, you're frightened off the grant reviewers. You're frightened off everybody. Uh, just make it 10 years and we'll change it back later. So <laughs> if that, that, thank you, Lou, for the 10-year idea. So if you wanted some stories, there they are. So that's the original RAIN study team and the sonographers and, uh, uh, and all the people. At the back, in the middle, that's, that's Professor Ian James, the Professor of Mathematics at UWA, who was helping out with the, with the statistical analyses. And this, this is what it looked like uh, uh, by 2008. This is the RAIN study team at the Vines. Uh, so you can see it's been growing. Lou, uh, so, um, Larry Balin's horizontal at the front. He's, he, he, he's vertical today, but that's all many of us looking a lot younger. What I want to show you, though, is the, is the budget. So the budget for the, the NH and MRC budget, Mary Rain's dying words were, you're not allowed to use any of my estate to buy equipment for hospitals. So the equipment had, had been funded through the NH and MRC grant. But if you look at this, you can see a research midwife, $12,800. But the big thing was the IBM personal computer for $13,000. So, that was, it didn't have a hard drive, it just had the floppy disks, and this was really revolutionary that we were going to computerise the data. You can, you can see that the midwife cost less than the computer. <laughs> uh, so type, times have changed a little bit. But the RAIN study, one of the reasons the RAIN studies worked is because it was just a moment in time when this was going to happen. I don't think I realised it at the time, but it was a moment in time. Computerisation had just come in. Without computerisation, this couldn't have happened. And ultrasound had just come of age, and the biometry, the measurements we made of the fetus, had just been finalised, if you wish. Head circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length. And they have not changed since that time. So it is by that moment, that one epoch of time, that enabled the RAIN study to, to, to really flourish and remain so relevant as it does today. But finally, I'd just like to say that it's, it's turned a full circle. So the data that we have from the RAIN study has been used to produce more than 600 publications. But in my world, my, my lifetime goal has always been to lower the rate of preterm birth across Australia and to use data from the RAIN study to do that. The RAIN study was never a good preterm birth study because preterm birth is only 8%, so the numbers are too small. It's not ideal. But it is very good for early term birth. And we have used the data from the RAIN study now to help launch our national program. We were funded by NH and MRC as a partnership grant through this university to expand the program into Eastern Australia in 2018. And last year we were in the federal budget, the May 2021 uh, federal budget for $13 million to, to nourish and build the Australian Preterm Birth Prevention Alliance, which has a single goal of safely lowering the rate of preterm birth across Australia. We've shown already we can lower the rate of early term birth by a third and almost immediately, and the rate of preterm birth somewhere between 10 and 20 per cent. This has grown out of the RAIN study. So the RAIN study has gone from just being a cohort study to being one of the key components in the world's first national preterm birth prevention program. Preterm birth is the major cause of death in young children and one of the major causes of disability throughout life. So next year, if I can, I would like to be able to tell the story of how we're using RAIN study data to close the circle between a cohort study and national policy. I'd like to conclude by just saying how honoured I am to stand here in front of you uh, to tell some of the stories that, from my perspective of what's happened, 
and to thank all of you for the wonderful contribution you have made and together we are making together. The RAIN study is truly one of Western Australia's great treasures and we must cherish it forever. Thank you very much.